So today we'll be going through on black body radiation. Okay, so this is an online recording, so I can't see any of your faces. So uh, if you have not any questions, you are not sure, just try to understand, okay? So the first part on black body radiation, okay, let's just go through. Now, black body radiation is an extension of what you have learned in terms of your O-level thermal physics, okay? Uh, what you learn for heat transfer by radiation, okay? So we learned that in terms of heat transfer, there's only conduction, convection, and radiation. And black body radiation here talks about the heat transfer by radiation, okay? So in short, in summary, you have just this formula. This is the power this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Okay, so just constant. It will be given to you during the Olympiad. This is the cross-sectional area A. Okay, all, all described at the bottom. E is something called the emissivity constant. And T is the temperature in Kelvins. So this power refers to the power or the heat that is being transferred out of the body per unit time. Okay, because power is energy per unit time. Okay, so temperature... Okay, you can see that it's proportional to temperature to the power of four. Okay, so this is what we call the Stefan's law. This constant, okay, this is a constant. So this E here, called emissivity, for a perfect black body is equals to one. Okay, for perfect black body. Okay, what, what did this E mean? Huh? Okay, let, let me just right finish this. Now, if you recall heat transfer by radiation, is that it is uh, for black colored objects or dark colored objects, the heat transfer by radiation is more than white color objects or silver color objects, okay? So this emissivity is about this amount of heat that is being transferred. Maybe in terms of, it can be color, it can be surface, it can be texture, doesn't matter, okay? So remember that radiation, heat transfer by radiation is affected by four variables, huh? which I call it TACT, tech, okay? So you have the temperature, you have the surface area, exposed surface area, you have its color, and you have a texture, okay? So emissivity will be affected by color and texture, okay? So it is different from different objects, of course, okay? Area and temperature is already inside the formula. So of course, E equals to zero for perfect reflector. Okay, means it does not radiate, it does not uh, absorb as well. Okay, now for this, it only tells you about the power that is emitted by the body. Okay, that it radiates out. But normally, what happens is that as it radiates, it absorbs as well. And because it absorbs as well, this is why we have a net power here. Okay. An object, let's say you have temperature T, connect with another object. It can be an environment or it can be another object with T naught. What happens is that, okay, maybe I will just put T naught as red color here. Okay. And the other one, I will use green color. So what happens is that there will be power that is being radiated outwards. Also, so in not just to the surroundings, but also to the other object. And this object will also radiate outwards. So between the objects themselves, there is heat transfer as well. Okay. So let's say, let's just say that you have an insulator. Okay, let's just put an insulator around yeah, around it so that it does there's no heat or minimal heat transfer to the surroundings only just these two objects here okay so now you have an insulator what happened is that all the power that is being transmitted will be true yeah uh okay what, what i want to say is that we let's Ignore the fact that there's, there is heat transfer to the surroundings. Okay? We just focus on this uh, highlighted part. Okay? Now, 
the area, let, let the area be, the area in contact will be A. Okay, maybe I'll just highlight here. The area in contact is A. Okay, so this green color, there will be power transfer, sigma A E T to the power of four. Whereas this red color will also have a power transfer, sigma A E T not power four. So for this, for each of them, there will be a net heat transfer either in or out, depending on their temperature. So you can see that if the temperature is higher, let's say this T is larger than T0, okay, means it's hotter, there will be temperature transfer, there will be heat transfer from there to here because it's hotter. Net heat transfer, okay? So the keywords that we use here is net heat being transferred over, okay? And yeah, it's a, because there's still heat transfer to and fro. So when their temperature is the same, the net heat transfer is zero. Okay, when the temperature is the same, the net heat transfer is zero. It doesn't mean that there's no heat transfer, but the net between them is going to be zero. Okay, so that is when, when the net heat transfer is zero. Did I write anything here? Okay, no. Okay, when the net heat transfer is zero, right? That's what we have thermal equilibrium. Okay, so thermal equilibrium. In other words, when they are same temperature, net heat transferred is equal to zero. Okay, or the net heat transfer per second will be P net. Okay, so of course you can see that based on the formula, it's going to be zero as well. Okay, so this is just black body radiation. Nothing much. You just need to know. Uh, these two formulas actually just need to know this one is good enough. Okay. One more thing that this tells you is that the rate of heat transfer, this is also from O levels. Okay. The rate of heat transfer is dependent on the difference in the temperature. So, of course, if one side is hotter, one side is cooler, okay, much cooler, much hotter the rate of heat transfer is faster, it's higher, okay? One example that you have is, let's say you have a, let's say, let me just change the color here. Let's say you have an object, you have water of, let's say, 80 degrees Celsius versus water of 60 degrees Celsius. Now, you want to wait for the water to cool down by 10 degrees. So this one will be to 70, this one will be to 50. So you realize that, this top one, okay, if, if, imagine if they are the same surroundings, which means that it's at room temperature and pressure, okay, on the surroundings. This top one here will cool down to 70 faster than the bottom one. Why? Because the temperature difference between 80 and 25 is larger than between 60 and 25. So there's more heat transfer to the surroundings. It loses heat faster. Its temperature goes down slower. It goes down faster, okay? Uh, assuming that the mass, everything, everything else is the same, okay, except for temperature. Okay, it will it will cool down faster. The time taken will be shorter. Okay, because the rate of heat transfer is larger. Okay, so this is for black body radiation. Okay, so in in this part, in this first page, not just you don't just learn black body radiation. You also learn this thing called thermal equilibrium, and this one we kept from O levels. Okay. Okay, so now we'll then move on to the next part of thermodynamics. First thing, internal energy. Okay. Internal energy is the sum of the random microscopic Ke and P of the atoms and molecules of a system. So what this means is that, okay, you see, we say that, let's say for solids, okay, for solids, when we in, in kinetic theory, right, we describe the particles in a solid, right, as in they are, they are vibrating about their fixed positions. Okay, for solids, they are vibrating about their fixed positions. Okay, for liquid, we know they are sliding over one another, and for gases, they are moving at random directions. Okay, at, at high speeds, so they are always moving. So because of that, the molecules itself or the atoms itself have kinetic energy. 
Okay, this is what we meant by the microscopic kinetic energy. It's not the kinetic energy of the system. It's the system moving this macro view. No, okay, it's inside the sum of the Ke of the molecules inside. Is this microscopic Ke? And this potential energy is dependent on the distance between the molecules. So the larger the distance, the higher the potential energy. Okay, so the potential energy for gas is larger than for liquid, is larger than for solid. Now, kinetic energy, the microscopic kinetic energy or the movements of the molecules okay, is dependent on the temperature. Why? Because temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. Okay, so everything is also written here. So you can take a look. Okay, you can read yourself. Okay, the temperature also uh, is also written here. So this is just a definition of internal energy for you. Okay, next we will be looking at the, this thing called the first law of thermodynamics. Now in thermodynamics, there are actually, uh, I think three laws, but of which, okay, here there's something called a zero law of thermodynamics. Okay. I think there's four laws. Yeah, but then like we'll, we'll look, look at the first three laws. The first, the first law is actually called a zero law. Okay, so then after that, then the second law is the first law. The reason is because the first law was uh, created first. Then they realized there must be a law before this, but they already named this the first law. So they named the other one, the earlier one, the zero law. So the zero law is just based on what you have went through earlier on thermal equilibrium. Okay, so zero law. So just talk about zero law, okay, which I didn't write it here. Zero law, okay, let me find a place to write. Okay, maybe here. Now for zeroth law, what happens is that you, let's say you have object A, object B, and object C. So the zeroth law, let me just type it out here. Zeroth law of thermal dynamics states that if A and B are in thermal equilibrium, and B and C are in thermal equilibrium, then A and C are also in thermal equilibrium. Now, thermal equilibrium just means that the net heat transfer is zero, okay? So let's say between A and B, the net heat transfer is zero. Between B and C, the net heat transfer is zero. So that's what they say. So if these two are in thermal equilibrium, these two are in thermal equilibrium, and you take out A and C put together, they will be in thermal equilibrium as well. Okay, but it's very basic. It's like saying that if these two are in the are the same temperature, these two are the same temperature, A and C must be in same temperature also. So it's a bit too basic. Okay, that's why it's a zero flaw. Okay. Then next part, first law. Now. The first law of thermodynamics states that the increase in internal energy of the system, which is the sum of the Ke and the Pe of the molecules, is equal to the sum of the heat supplied to the system and work done on the system. Okay, so you need to consider that it's actually heat supplied by and work done by system as well. Okay, but uh, that's why the bolded words here. So you need to look carefully when you read different textbooks. Okay or if you ever read another textbook or notes. But more, majority of it should be using work done on. Okay, there's a difference which I will go through later. So this first law of thermodynamics, right, is in a way it tells you that, tells you how the internal energy changes, okay? So you can see that it is a statement of conservation of energy. Just that in a way it's limitation because conservation of energy, I mean, you can say that the increase in internal energy, can it be due to let's say, an uh, increase in GP, okay, or, loss, or, or due to a loss in GP, which is not possible in this case, okay? What it's saying is that the increase in internal energy is solely due to these two kinds of energy, okay? So it's a statement of conservation of energy with a limitation. So it can be expressed in this form, okay? This is just the formula. Now, let's talk about internal uh, heat supply first. He supplied two, okay, this is pretty, or delta Q. Okay, this is pretty straightforward. If it's taken out of the system, then delta Q is negative. If it's heat input into the system, then it will be positive. Okay? Now, 
Okay, the consequence of conservation of energy is uh, return here. Okay. So next is what is delta W? Now, delta W is work done on the system. Okay, let's consider. I mean, let me just go to a blank page again. Let's consider uh, you have a, some shrink here and you're exerting a force on the air here. Okay, so let's say that you're only exert moved by a little bit such that the pressure doesn't change yet. Okay, so because of that, to move this thing by a short distance of D with a force F, cross-sectional area A, the work done on system, work done on the air, force times distance. Okay, so if it compresses the air, if there's a reduction in volume, okay, volume decreases, then there is a positive work done on the system. Okay, to me, I see it as somebody sitting on the system like that. So it's that you sit on, so it compresses it. Okay, but if it's the other way around, okay, work done on is positive. If it's the other way around, means your air, Okay, it's increasing in volume. Then this will be the delta W is negative. See? This is where volume increases. So as long as volume decreases, it will be a positive value. And when it increases, when the volume increases, delta W it will be a negative value. Okay, we are trying to explain here what it means by work done on system. Okay, there's also a work done by system. So if you see the word by, it is the negative of work done on. So it's a very English thing here. Okay, so now let's consider that the fact that let's say the pressure is constant. Okay, so if pressure is constant, okay, it must be large enough, of course. If it's too small, then of course it will change the pressure. Okay, but if pressure is constant, Basically, force is actually pressure times area. Okay, pressure is force over area. And area times D is volume. So for constant pressure, the work done on a system can also be calculated as P delta B. Okay, and make sure it's a positive value if there's a decrease in volume. Okay, this is also written here. We'll come to this graph later. Now, this heat is applied to more things on it. It can also mean uh, Q equals to MC delta theta. Okay, that's how you use the Q. So, it's linked to that as well. Okay, so it could be given to you. It could be calculated or it could uh, by Q equals to MC delta theta as well. Okay, or it could be calculated by first law of thermodynamics. We'll come to the applications later. Okay, so... After the first law of thermodynamics, the next thing you need to know is what is an ideal gas? Okay, ideal gas is just a gas that follows the ideal gas equation. PV equals to nRT or PV equals to nKT. Okay, the difference you can see is just the nR and the nK. Okay, and nR is, N is just basically number of moles of gas. R is uh, universal gas constant will be given to you in the Olympiad. For this case, this number and this Boltzmann constant, which is also given in the Olympiad. There is a leap of the least of constants. But basically, nR equals to nK. But apart from that, nothing much. Okay, there's just a relation here. So how does PV equals nRT come about? Okay, it comes about uh, based on empirical calculations. So from your old levels, right? What happens is that you learn that P is proportional to T if volume constant. You also learn V is proportional to T if pressure constant. And the last one, P is inversely proportional to V if temperature constant. What these three terms means is that P is equals to K times of T if V is constant, or V equals to H times of T if P is constant, 
or P V equals constant if T is equals constant. Okay, P V equals to some other value. Okay, that's the third one for proportion. So when you combine these three, you get P V over T equals constant. And they found that the constant is actually just an R. Okay, so this only occurs when it is a closed system because I mean, you can't, if you, if you add in more air, like you pump air into a, let's say for example, you pump air into a car tire, the volume, okay, maybe if it's like the tire is really full, near full already, you pump more air in, the temperature doesn't change much, the volume doesn't change much, but the pressure change, changes substantially. Okay, so in that case, what happens is that it is not a closed system, the number of moles will change. The one will be changing at the end when you pump more air in. But generally, what happens is that if number of molecules doesn't change, this NK or NR will be constant. Okay, this one is if you put air in. So if, if it's a constant, then PV over T, P1, V1 over T1 equals to P2, V2 over T2. Okay. Up to here, okay. There will be quite a have been quite a fair bit of stuff. So so far we have been we have been, uh, been through black body radiation, thermal equilibrium, internal energy, zero flaw, first law, and ideal gas. Okay. Okay, so next we will jump to the basic training here. We'll go straight to question two. We'll come to question one later. So let's jump to question two first. I will I will want to go through two. Three and four. Okay, you can take a look at the questions. You can pause the video and take a look at the questions. Okay. Now for question two, okay, basically it's just a question to train you on usage of PV equals to NRT and PV equals to NKT. Take note, when you use the formulas, the quantities are in their SI units. You know, the values you need to choose based on the SI units. So that means that the temperature is not in degrees Celsius as written here. It must be in terms of the Kelvins. Okay. So you need to convert 20 degrees Celsius to Kelvins. So 20 degrees, uh, I think for your, for Olympia, will be, we'll, just, we'll still use 273. So 20 plus 273, you'll get 293 Kelvins. Okay, so for 293 Kelvins, you, you need to sub this into PV equals to NRT. So for a number of moles, you're finding N. Okay, R is 8.31. So PV 0 0.8, uh, 1.1 times 10 power 5 times 0.8, divided by 8.31 divided by the temperature 293, you will get around 36.1 moles. Okay, and number of molecules, you can still use this or you can just straight away use 36.1 multiplied by Avogadro constant. Both are okay. So I'll just multiply by Avogadro constant, you'll get 2.18 times 10 to the power of 25. Okay, number, number has no unit, so just, just like that. Okay, question three. A fixed mass of monoatomic gas, okay, this is an ideal gas, has a temperature of 127 and a pressure of 0 0.55. Now, if the temperature is then increased and the density is half, find the final pressure. So you can see that this is a closed system, so that means that P1, V1 over T1 equals to P2, V2 over T2. So P1, okay, let's let the P1 be the final pressure. Okay, we let this be the final. So easier, I want to keep it on the left. So P1 with the fine is what we want to find. Final volume, okay, we, we'll come back to that later. Final temperature, 227. Remember to plus 273, you get 500 Kelvins. Okay, we'll come back to the volume later. P2 will be 0 0.55. I will just shortcut the 10 power 6 by writing a capital M for mega. We'll come back to V later. Over 
one, two, seven plus two, seven, three, you'll get 400 kelvins. Now, we see that the density is halved. Okay, so there are two ways to see this. One is the number of molecule change, one is the volume changed. Okay, because if the number of particles is half, the density will also half because the mass is half. Okay, that's if you draw air out of the cylinder. Now, we, when we use this formula, okay, this formula is already assuming that the N is going to be constant. So we want to keep this constant. So only way is if this is V, this will be 2V. Double the volume. Means you increase the volume of the cylinder. Okay, let's say it's a one with a piston where you can increase the volume. Okay, the other one is decrease the end, but it's harder to apply here. So near from here is pretty straightforward. We are just going to cancel the V. And we will get our P1 as 0.55 divided by 400 times 500, then divided by 2, you'll get 0 0.34 megapascals. That will be the answer. Question 4. Volume V, 4V, connected by a capillary tube. Okay, so... What happens here is uh, you have two volumes, okay? You have a V and a 4V, and they're connected by a tube, okay, of negligible volume. So the larger container is warm up, okay? The first part, why, can, why may we not apply PV over T to each container separately? Now, because of this capillary tube, for part A, it's just because the number of molecules does not stay constant in each container. The number of molecules that does not stay a constant in each container. Okay, the total number do stay constant, but in each container, when it's separate, it's not constant. Okay, separately not constant, but total constant. So because total constant, now let's put in the values. Okay, I'll just change the blue color here. So for the V, under the volume V, we have initially 280, final 210. Okay, initially 101 kilopascals, final, we just put it as P2. For the 4V, initially 280, final 350, this is the temperature. Pressure, initially also 101 kilo. Final, let it be P2. Okay, we let it be just below. I remove the units here. Kilo for 10 power 3. Okay, so what happened is that N1, the initial, the initial, okay, let me just change the formula a little bit. We know that PV equals to NRT. Okay, let's just use this blank space here. We know that, okay, let me just rewrite everything here. So this is from 280 to 210. This is from 101 kilopascals to P2. Whereas for the 4V, it's going to be 280 to 350 and 101 kilopascals to a P2. Now they have the same pressure because they are connected by a capillary tube. So the pressure has to be the same. If not, air will move between them. Okay, we want the question wants in a way they want it uh, the final pressure means after everything has moved, after all the cooling and warming and all the movement, what is the final pressure? And the final pressure will be the same for both. If not, it's, it's not called final. Okay, so now what happens is that we have PV equals to NRT and that N equals to PV over RT. Now, the initial N of this and the initial N of this. Okay, well, the sum of the initial ends is equal to the sum of the final ends. The sum of the initial number of moles of both containers is equal to the sum of the final. Okay, because it's a closed system, but for each individual one, it's not. Okay, each individual, the, the air molecules can still move along the tube to the other side. But for the entire system, it's going to be 
same. A is a closed system. So we will use this formula. So 101 kilo V over R280 plus 101 kilo Four V over two eight O, R times two eight O. This is the total. Let me just make it nicer here. This is the total initial volume. Okay. Oh, sorry. Total initial number of moles. The n for V and the n for four V. The total initial must be equals to the total final. In this case, the final temperature is two one zero plus P two. 4V R over 350. Okay. So the, the total initial equals the total final number of moles. And this is where we, that, where we then do our math. Okay, just cancel, cancel the V and the R, cancel the V and the R, cancel the V and the R. I'll just cancel the tens in the denominator as well. So here we just need to solve for math. Okay, so 505 kilo over 28. Equals to P2, 1 over, oh, forgot this one, 1 over 21 plus 4 over 35. So when you rearrange and do your calculations, you should get 111 kilopascals as per the answer. Okay, this kilo, we keep the K there so that it's still, we know that it's 10 power 3. Okay, that's one of the shortcuts you can use. Okay, so that is for question 4. Hope you understand. Okay, now we will go back to the theory part. Okay. So up to now, you have learned what is an ideal gas as well. Okay. So next is the internal energy for an ideal gas. Now an ideal gas, right, apart from being, uh, being a gas that follows the ideal gas equation, right, it has one more property, which is that the potential energy is zero. Okay, so the internal energy, the internal en energy, remember, is the sum of the Ke and Pe, the sum of the kinetic and potential energy of a system. But specific for ideal gas, the potential energy is going to be zero. So the internal energy of this ideal gas is given by this formula, which is actually the sum of all the Ke of the molecules. Okay, the proof, uh, we will not go through. Okay, well, I'll just give you the formula straight so you can just know that it's going to be 3 over 2 nRT. Okay, those are the internal energy. Okay, the zero potential energy is also mentioned here. And as well as we can find if we equate this uh, I'll put this as big M. Okay, let me change this to big M. Capital M. Okay, this mass is the mass of gas. This one, and there's a square, in, the square should be inside, not outside. Okay, typo. So, this one is what we call the root, uh, wait, okay, this one, there's a mistake here. Help me change this to, with a square root sign. Okay. This is what we call the root mean square. Okay, because mathematical notation wise, this is square, this is called taking average, and then you square root the average. So it should be like this. This is called the root mean square. Okay, so root mean square is the sum of, is a square root of the average of the squares. Okay, but it means you square everything, you sum them up, you take average. Okay, uh, there is again, I know, so many typos here. Okay, let's uh, divide by n here as well. You take average, then you square root. Okay, I, I need to do all this here. Okay, there is a mistake here. Yeah. So take note of this mistake here. Okay, remember to change it. Okay, so what exactly is looking square? Okay, here you can see. So now we'll go on to the basic question to have an understanding of root mean square, which is on question one. Okay, if you want to try yourself, you can pause the video. So mean speed is just going to be 
average. So if you sum this up, 1 plus 7 plus 9 plus 5 plus 5 plus 6 plus 6 plus 5 plus 3 plus 4, sum up and divide by 10, you should get 5.1. Now for root mean square is different. You need to sum up 1 square plus 7 square plus 9 square plus 5 square plus 5 square plus 6 square plus 6 square plus 5 square plus 3 square plus 4 square. All the squares. And then you divide by 10. Then you square root you'll get 5.5. .5. So you can see that root mean square and mean speed, root mean square speed and mean speed, they are two slightly two different values. Okay? They, they can be quite close, but they will still be slightly different. And the reason why you want to do root mean square is because it's a better indication of the average Ke, which gives a better indication of the average, uh, of the temperature itself. Because temperature, again, is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Okay? Okay, so that is for root mean square value. So now we'll go back. Okay, now you can go back to the notes and we'll go on to the next part, which is to understand what is a pressure volume diagram or what we call a PV diagram. Okay, so what exactly is a pressure volume diagram? Okay, so basically you can see from the diagram, it's just a graph. Okay, Y axis pressure, X axis volume. And... We use this PV diagram, right, to try and illustrate four common processes, okay? Thermod we call them thermodynamic processes. And of course, there are processes that are not within these four, but these are four that are more standard that we can actually do calculations with. So that's why normally questions will come up with those, okay? So the first process is called an isobaric process. Now, isobaric, Okay, the pressure in the past, SI units was not Pascal's, okay? They usually, uh, they use bars to measure. So it was like measuring bars. One bar is one atmospheric pressure, something like that. So isobaric process means it's a constant pressure. So on a PV diagram, you can see that it's going to be a, just a straight line, horizontal line. Okay, pressure is constant, only volume changes. Second BC is called isovolumetric or another name is called isochloric. So isochloric or isovolumetric, usually we use isochloric nowadays, okay? So it's just constant volume, that's why it's a vertical line, okay? Because no volume changes. AC is isothermal, so along here we call it an isothermal line. Isothermal means constant temperature. Now for AB, constant pressure, right, means that, you can see that this means that uh, V, is proportional to T, okay? Under constant pressure, this is from the O-levels kinetic theory. Constant volume means your pressure is proportional to temperature, but here doesn't show much because it just shows that here and here is different temperature and B and C is different temperature. That's it. But for AC, isothermal constant temperature, it means that P is inversely proportional to V, okay? That means that when you plot on a PV diagram, you get a one over X curve. That's why it's a curve here, okay? And lastly, is this thing called adiabatic process. Adiabatic process just means there is no heat transfer, no heat exchange with the surroundings. Okay, so because of that, there will be temperature changes. Now, AC, isothermal, no change in temperature doesn't mean no heat exchanges. Okay, later, I will explain a little bit, but just take note of that. Okay, no heat exchange only means adiabatic. Adiabatic okay, is going to be just delta Q equals to zero. Okay, this is all linked to the first law of thermodynamics. Now, for an ideal gas along an isothermal line, which in this case is going to be like ACD, uh, oops, uh, let's redo this part. So let's say for ACD, this line, it is going to be, it's an ideal gas, it's a constant temperature, internal energy remains the same. Okay, why it remains the same? Because Remember, internal energy is 3 over 2 nRT. So constant temperature, we have constant internal energy. Okay, so these are the four processes. At least you need to know how they are like, what they look like, okay, what they do. That's about it. Okay, so now we'll go from here to a more complicated version. Okay, now you can go to the worksheet again. We'll jump a little bit, we'll come back to the earlier one later. Okay, so this is just for you to understand more on the PV diagram. Okay, 
So for this PV diagram, what happens is that uh, you need to fill in positive, negative for any changes, whether it's isobaric, isochloric, or isovolumetric. Okay. Uh, isothermal and adiabatic. Okay. So this is uh, something I came up with last year okay, for the Olympiad students. And then it was very useful. I use it for the A-level students now. So, okay. so it's uh, something that is very useful. You can keep it for your A-levels as well. Okay, so now what you need to do here is to fill in positive and negative. Okay. In terms of the changes. Now, for isobaric expansion, Isobaric in the PV diagram is going to be in going to be horizontal. Expansion means volume increase. Contraction means volume decrease. Now, if you recall from the earlier parts, volume increase means your delta W must be negative. Volume decrease means your delta W must be positive. Okay, that is isobaric. Now, isobaric also means that volume is proportional to temperature, okay, for both. So, this is because it's a constant pressure. Now, when your volume increases, means your temperature will increase. So, plus, volume decrease, temperature decrease. And U and T are the same because U equals to 3 over 2 and RT. So, if T increases, U will increase. Same for this. Decrease, decrease. Now, delta Q is the odd one now. And this is where we need to use first law of thermodynamics when you analyze a PV diagram. Okay. So for first law of thermodynamics, we know that delta W plus delta Q equals delta U. So here must be a plus so that when you add up these two, you will still get a plus. It must, the magnitude of this is even bigger so that you can turn it positive. Okay. So same here will be minus. And again, if you draw the PV diagram, here will be also horizontal, but decreasing. Okay, next. Isochloric means constant volume. Constant volume means pressure is proportional to temperature. Now, pressure proportional to temperature means that, okay, first thing, constant volume first. Okay, constant volume means there's no change in volume. Now, your this delta W, right? Okay, just now we prove that it's going to be P delta V, if you recall. So, there is no change in volume means that the work done is going to be zero. Heating means we're going to go up because heating will give you higher temperature. Cooling, lower temperature. So, this will cause pressure to increase because it's proportional and pressure here to decrease. Same here, you're going to be plus, you're going to be minus. They are going to be always the same. And again, this plus this equals to this, this. So this first law of thermodynamics. So this is your final answer. Okay, third, isothermal expansion. Now for isothermal expansion and contraction, again, expansion volume increase, volume decrease. Same thing, this is... T constant, your P is inversely proportional to V. Now, all expansion and contraction for delta W will be the same because that is how it is defined. So here is a negative, here is a positive. Isothermal means here no change in temperature. So here no change in internal volume, uh, internal energy as well. So because of this plus this equals to this, to get a zero, it must have a plus here and a minus here. Okay, and in terms of drawing, it's just a 1 over x curve. Expansion, contraction. Adiabatic simply just means delta Q. So this is delta Q. Let me just write it again. Delta Q, zero. No heat exchange with the surroundings. That's all. Okay, now when expansion again, is this is still negative, this is still positive. So because of that, your delta U, okay, your delta U is going to be this plus this equals to this. It'll be negative and positive. And again, this follows. This case, it looks almost the same as the isothermal. 
You can't really tell when it's just like this. Okay, you can only tell when you put them together and this will be a steeper line. That's all. Okay, so this is how we can analyze a PV diagram in terms and link it with the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, so that is for up to the PV diagram part. Okay, so the next part, okay, more on concepts. Now, the work done by ideal gas. So just now I mentioned the work done by ideal gas for a PV diagram, okay. Now for a constant pressure, because this was what we went through at the very start of the class, the work done is actually P delta V. Okay, that is also written your isobaric process. Okay, again, positive, negative, you have to take note of it, okay, whether it's expansion or contraction. But you can see that P delta V is actually the same as the area on the graph. So we can actually say that it's just the area on the graph. In fact, the work done is actually integrate P dV, but you don't need to know that. Okay, so that's why you get the area on the graph. And for isochloric, work done is zero because there's no area on the graph. Okay, now, why we learn the thing is that because why we learn the processes because we usually want to use them in a what we call a cycle, a process cycle, a thermal dynamic cycle. Okay, so in this cycle, it moves from A to B to C to D back to A, and the whole process repeats. And you want the gas to go back to its original state. If not, you will, I mean, if it doesn't go in a cycle, right, it will just like keep changing state forever. Okay, so we want it to go back to its original state so that this cycle can go on and on and on, and it's predictable. Okay, so this is what we call a process cycle. And you can see that, okay, when it is expanding for this case, I say for this case here, expansion in volume delta W is negative. But if it's contraction, it's, neg it's positive. So you can see that for A, B, C, D, the, ne the negative work done on is larger than the positive. Okay, the area under graph for this part, the expansion is larger than the area under graph for the contraction. This means that there is net the net work done on system is negative. Okay, work done on system. We are con considering my work done on system. Okay, so for this style cycle, the net work done on system is negative. Okay, that is for this type of cycle. Now, you will recall from the very front part, I mentioned that work done by is the negative of work done on. The work done by the system is negative, but the work done on the system, the opposite of each other. It's just an English thing. Okay, so work done. So in this case, net work done is negative. It also means that net work done by system. And one more thing, net work done by the system is positive. So, so what does this really mean? Network done being like network done by system being positive. Okay. So to be more proper, what it means is that okay, let me just put here. When we're saying network done positive, network done by okay, the by and on is very interesting. So it's very important, huh? So network done by is positive means that you are actually giving energy to the system and the system does work. Typically, you'll be giving in heat energy for a thermal dynamic cycle. Okay? So, an example of such a system is a heat engine. A heat engine is one that takes in heat, called QH, does work, but all, not all the heat is the, used to do work. So you'll have some output, we call it Q low. Okay, Q high and Q low. So Q high minus Q low is the delta Q, the net heat supplied to the system. Now in a thermodynamic cycle, we're actually representing this okay, in the whole thermodynamic cycle. Let's say we are going this direction. Okay, this clockwise direction. So, so the network done on system is going to be negative and network done by system is positive, simply because the area under the curve 
Okay, let's say for AB, the area under the curve due to AB is a yellow color. The area under the curve due to CD is this blue color. And the yellow is larger than the blue. Okay, yellow is network done on system being negative and this is positive. So the value is larger. The magnitude is larger. So the, that's why there's network done on system being negative, which means network done by is positive. Okay, so this is a heat engine that represents the system. Or you can say the PV diagram represents this heat engine. Okay, now for a full complete thermodynamic cycle here, let's say A, B, C, D. Remember, U is equal to 3 over 2 nRT. And PV equals to nRT. It means that at any of these PV values, as long as the PV value is the same, the T will give you the same value. Okay, because it's constant here. Closed system is going to be constant. So for whole thermodynamic cycle, you go back to the same point. You go back to the same temperature. It goes back to the same internal energy. Okay? That is why for whole... Uh, it's not written here. For whole thermodynamic cycle, I've written here. The change in internal energy is always zero. In other words, for entire cycle, Delta U is equal to zero for a cycle. Now, to go on further to understand this, okay, so it means that if your Delta U equals to Delta Q plus Delta W, your first law, this is going to be zero, this is going to be negative, this is going to be positive. Okay, because again, this is negative because it's work done on system. Here is work done by system. Okay, negative. You're negative. You're positive. So they are opposite of each other. Okay, in terms of uh, mag magnitude, they are the same, but one positive, one negative. Here. So your job is apart from being needed to calculate the work done by area under graph, is also to know that, that this is a process for something called heat energy, that's all. Okay? How about the reverse? The reverse is where it will be an anti-clockwise cycle. Okay, so you can see that this is going to be a clockwise direction here. That's why, we're, that's why this is what we calculate. Uh, Anti-clockwise cycle will be something like that. Again, this is a PV diagram. We'll be going this way, this way, this way, this way. Let's say A, B, C, D. Now you can see that D to A, there will be work done on system. And it's positive. B to C, is work done by system positive. Okay, or work done on system is negative. This one is your delta W. This one also. Okay, work done on. So, again, work done is the area under graph. The area under graph for, and for AD is larger than the area under graph for BC. So because of that, we say that there is net work done on system. Because the net work done on system is going to be positive. Net work done on system being positive, right? Means that, it means that we have negative delta Q. Okay, Delta Q must be negative. Reason being, again, delta U equals to zero for a cycle. And this is equal to delta Q plus delta W. And this one established to be positive. This one must be negative. Negative means there's heat supplied to the system. There's heat taken away from a system. Heat lost to the surroundings. There's positive work done to take heat away. So heat taken away, this is a system used for uh, aircon or fridge. Okay, of course, the aircon is going to be more complicated than this, but uh, our fridge as well. But this is just a simplified example. So in short, it's just about thermodynamic cycle. Clockwise cycle, there's network done, which is here, the summary will be here. Network done on system is negative. Network done by system is positive. And when it's any clockwise, it will be the opposite. Okay? And for a change for entire 
cycle, the change in internal energy is going to be zero. Okay. Now, last part on this, this is an example of the heat engine and the refrigerator. So you also may need to sometimes calculate efficiency. Now your delta Q is given by QH minus QC. And delta Q, you can see, is equal to delta W in terms of the magnitude. So the thing is, if you want to calculate the work done, we cannot divide by delta Q. Or in the efficiency, we cannot divide by delta Q. Okay, because it's about energy input. This is the formula for efficiency. This is the input. These two are the output. So this is the input. This is the useful output. This is the wasted output. From here, we can then calculate our efficiency. Okay, that is the efficiency of a heat engine. Now, for refrigerator, of course, it's going to be different. Okay, uh, usually they will ask this. It's just more coefficient of performance, but nothing special. Okay, usually they will ask more of this one, just for you to see. Okay. So it's a lot of concepts. So now let's try a question before we come back to the last concept. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we'll try one thermodynamic cycle here. Okay, this is a thermodynamic cycle question. Okay, you may want to pause the video to read through. So a heat engine consists of, contains an ideal amount of atomic gas. It goes through a cyclic process as shown. Cyclic or thermodynamic process, same thing. It's going to one full cycle. So at A, is given to you 300 kelvins. B to C is isothermal. So refer to this graph, fill up the spaces. So for A to B, it's going to be isochloric. So delta W will be zero. Isochloric constant volume means pressure proportional to temperature. There's an increase in pressure, so an increase in temperature. This and this the same, so here it will be a plus. And because of first law of therm thermodynamics, this equals to this plus this, here must be a plus. First line, done. Second line, B to C is isothermal, so no change in temperature, no change in internal energy. Same, it's going to increase in volume, so your delta W is negative, so this must be a positive, so that this is zero. C to A is isobaric. Isobaric means V proportional to T. V decrease. Okay, so decrease in V will lead to an increase, a positive work done on, but it will lead to a negative delta T. So this means that your delta U must be negative. And to, for the first law of thermodynamics to be valid, delta Q must be negative. Okay, so that's how you do the first question. Second, find the number of moles. Okay, so immediately you see this, you'll be using PV equals to NRT. And from the question, you are given T only for A, 300 kelvins. You also have the reading, one, remember this one, 10 power 5, and 5 times 10 power minus 2. So 1 times 10 power 5, 5 times 10 power minus 2 equals to N, 8.31 times 300 kelvins. So 5 times 10 power 3, we multiply the first one by 5 times 10 power 3, divide by 8.31, divide by 300, I get my N number of moles as 2.0 moles. Part C, calculate the heat supply, this calculate delta Q, that's for path A, B. So to calculate delta Q, okay, to calculate delta Q, basically you will need first law of thermodynamics, delta U equals to delta Q plus delta W, or delta W equals to delta Q minus delta, uh, delta U minus delta Q. Okay, you are finding delta Q. Delta Q minus delta, uh, delta W.
Now, change in internal energy. Okay, one more trick. Huh? We know that U is equal to 3 over 2 nRT. And because PV equals nRT, you can use 3 over 2 PV. Okay? So, from here, you can actually find delta U. You just need to find 3 over 2 PV for, the, for B. Means you find the 3 over 2 PV value for here. Okay, minus a 3 over 2 PV value for you. Okay. So I'll just continue here. You, uh, B will be 4 times 5. Minus A will be 1 times 5. times 10 power 3, okay, because the 5 times 10 power 5, 10 power might still be inside. So I just pull it out. Minus delta W. A to B, the delta W is 0. So we can just minus 0. So I will get 2, 2, 5, 0, 0 joules. Okay, last part. What is the work done by the gas from C to A? So this is the isobaric. Work done by gas. The proper formula will be P delta V and it must be a negative value because it is being compressed. Okay, the volume decreasing. So work done on is positive. Work done by will be negative. So we need a negative value. So I just put a negative value out and P is 1 times 10 power 5. Delta V, the change in volume, we can just take the magnitude, which is 15, times 10 power minus 2. Minus 1.5 times 10 to the power of 2 joules. Okay, so this is for this. Now let's go through two more. Uh, let's see where's the next one to go through. Okay, so that's most of the concepts we went through. So now let's go through uh, some additional question before I go on to the last concept. Okay, so now we'll, we'll make use of your O-level knowledge, okay? To touch on Q equals to MC delta theta. So you may want to pause the video here to take a quick look at question six and question seven, okay? So you can just pause here and then look and try to see whether you can do it. Okay, so this is a heater that's being used to determine the specific heat capacity of a liquid. Now, it's going to use, this question is going to use similar concepts to what you have learned at O levels. Specifically, we are going to use Q equals to MC delta theta here. So the only problem with Q equals MC delta theta is that there may be heat loss to surroundings. Even though we have, may have insulation, there can still be heat loss to surroundings or even the thermometer may absorb heat, the glass may absorb heat. So all this can cause problems and that is where the continuous flow method comes in. So in this setup, what happens is that water flows in at a certain rate Okay, at a certain temperature that is fixed. So we adjust the rate, we adjust the power such that this theta 2 is the same for both experiment. And why we want that is because the rate of heat loss to surroundings will be constant. Okay, because again, the rate of heat loss to surroundings depends on the temperature difference with the surroundings. So now we keep the rate of heat loss constant. So you do two experiments where first one, three grams of water flow pass per unit time or per second when the power is 219. And five grams flow, flow pass when it's 345. Okay, as you can see that we arrange, we change the number of flow rate such that the ending part in this case is still 45 degrees. 30 degrees at the start, 45 degrees to the end. Okay, it has to be kept constant here. So why are they kept constant? Okay, main thing is to ensure that the rate of heat loss to the surroundings is constant. 
And why do we want to do that? So that we can eliminate, so that, we, so that it can be eliminated in the calculations. So next, you need to show the specific heat capacity. So for experiment one, what happens is that Q equals to MC delta theta. Q is the energy. So it's like you have 219 per unit time, let's say one second. So this is the energy per unit time equals to M C delta theta is 15 plus heat loss of surroundings, equation one. For experiment two, three, four, five times one equals to five over 1,000 times C times 15 plus H. Again, because they are very similar in temperature, you know, they are similar in terms of temperature and the inlet and outlet, the heat loss to surrounding should be similar. So basically, you just need to take equation two minus equation one. 345 minus 219, you get 126 equals to 3 over 1000, no, 2 over 1000, okay, 5 minus 3 is 2, C, 15. The plus H will cancel out because you minus them off. So from here, C will just get, give you 4200 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. Okay, now can okay, look at the next question, question seven. Okay, again, you can pause the video if you haven't read. So consider a heater used to measure the specific latent heat of vaporization. So this is just an example. Again, same thing, we want to consider heat loss of surroundings. Okay, so why is the heat loss of surroundings the same? Because same temperature. Same temperature difference over same period of time. And find the specific latent heat. So in this case, you'll be using Q equals to ML. The Q again is the energy supplied. So for experiment one, it will be MC delta theta. MC, hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh, MC delta theta, careless. We are talking about latent heat, sorry. So we'll be using Q equals ML. Yeah. 2.2 times 10 power 6. So this is ML, Q equals ML. Hey, sorry. ML is the amount that's reason, okay? So we need the power, same thing. Q equals ML, the power, it will be 220. And let me erase the whole thing. We start this tip. So 220. Okay, I just saw the one you can erase. This is the power supply equals to ML. You see, it's similar. Again, plus a H, a heat loss to surroundings. Repeat the same thing over five minutes. Sorry, sorry. I'm supposed to find L. So we don't need this. You're supposed to find this as L. Then I just use capital L so that it's clearer. This equation one is equation two. So now we'll take two minus one. Okay, and then when you solve the H will gone, will be gone, and you can just straight away show that L is 2.2 times 10 to the power of six. Okay, let me just verify. Two point two zero five times ten power six. So that's reduced to two point two times ten power six. So it's shown. Okay. So the key thing for this two, the advantage is that when you do such a setup, 
you can control, you can eliminate heat loss of surroundings because of the same te constant temperature with the difference with the surroundings. Constant temperature difference with surroundings, okay? Okay, Ken, so that is for these two. Now, let's go to try some of the questions, okay? We just do a simple one. And we try one of the later versions, okay? The answers are all at the back, so you can actually take a quick look. Okay, you can see some of the questions are pretty straightforward, like in the equation PV equals NLT, what are all this? Okay, you can see it's, it's, it's quite basic in a way, so it's quite worth to learn this chapter. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Uh, you might want to try this. And okay, these are just using PV equals NRT, nothing special. Okay, this one is a little bit out of the Olympiad syllabus, but uh, you can take a quick look at it. Okay, basically when when it is when we talk about objects, right? Okay, for question 38, just for a quick going through. When we talk about objects, if it's just a single molecule, you only move in 3D directions. But when it's a this model too, this is at a, still at lower temperatures, it will be rigid. So it has rotation. You can rotate clockwise. You can rotate about this axis as well, a, a vertical axis, or you can rotate about uh, just like that, okay? But for this one, it's a very high temperature because apart from just movement and rotation, it will also like move in an oscillatory motion. So there's additional motion within themselves as well. Okay, so there's the two different models. Okay, so that's why answer it should be E. You choose either one depending on the temperature. Okay, so let me check. Question today is E, yeah. Okay, okay I take a quick look, finish ready. Okay, all these are quite interesting. You might want to try a simple one. So let's try question 35. Okay, this is on a heat engine, so you can take a quick look. Okay. A heat engine takes in and convert parts of the work into mechanical work and the efficiency is one third. Suppose all the waste heat is, can be channeled into the subsequent similar engine as heat input. What is the minimum engine units required to convert 99.9% .9 into work? Okay. So efficiency is one third. It's already we went through that just now. So this is the input. This is the wasted. This is the useful output. So this means that Q1 minus Q2, I don't know, Q1 minus Q2 is the first thing W1 is definitely Q1 minus Q2. And W1 over Q1 is the efficiency. This is now going to be one third. Okay, we just look at the first one. So from here, we can see that W1 being Q1 minus, one, minus Q2 is the same as 1 minus Q2 over Q1 equals to 1 third. Okay, let me just uh, do it here. 1 minus Q2 over Q1 is now equals to 1 third. Or Q2 over Q1 must be equals to 2 third. 2 third is wasted, man, correct? So it means that each of this is two-thirds of the previous one. This is going to be two-thirds of the previous one. This is going to be two-thirds of the previous one. Okay. So we can see that Q2 is equal to two-thirds Q1. Q3 is going to be two-thirds Q2, which is going to be two-thirds square of Q1. Q4 is going to be two-thirds of Q3, and it's going to be two-thirds Q of Q1. Now, they want 99.99% converted into work. That means that at a certain Qn that is output, which is going to be two-thirds to the power of n minus one of Q1. Okay. This, okay, we got y to n minus one because this is power one here. When it's three, this is two. Okay, two, this is going to be one. Three is two. Four is three. So n will be n minus one. So you observe the pattern here. And being 99.9% .9 means that this one, the remaining wasted energy is only 0.01%. Or in other words, two-thirds of the power of n minus one 
is equals to 0 0.01 over 100. Okay, let's take a quick look. Yep. Okay, so you can solve based on this. Let's try. And let me erase this part. So solving this using ln, okay, you can use n minus 1 equals to ln 0 0.01 over 100. You want to use logarithm also can, over ln 2 third. You will get actually 22.7 or n minus 1 equals to 23.7, which, which means that n equals, no, n equals to 23.7, okay. So you need minimum of 24. Now 24, okay, when we say 24, right, it's not 24 of this case. 24 is not the answer here. It's actually C. Now, why? It's because two, you have one year. So we have 24 of these queues. You go until Q24. By the time Q24, inside, in between, there's only 23 engine units. So answer is 23. Huh? Okay. So after 23 units, you'll go 99.99% is converted into work. Okay. So this is a very max question, as you can see. Okay. So you can try, the questions are generally not too hard. Okay. So you can take a quick look at all this. Okay, PV diagram all here as well. Okay, isochloric, you can see now you should understand already. Isochloric, isobaric. Okay. So now let's go back to the last concept. Okay, which is wind's displacement law. Again, this is actually built on the black body radiation. So it builds on black body for different temperatures. It's telling you that the curve peaks at different wavelengths. Okay, specifically for the infrared waves. So this is how the graph looks like. Okay. And take a quick look at this. Okay, so the, the you need to know the difference between this law and black body radiation, okay? Which probably I should have gone through at the start of the lesson. So black body radiation now for you to recall, basically P is equals to sigma AET to the power of four, okay? So black body radiation tells you how much energy is being projected outwards, being transmitted outwards by radiation. Okay, transfer outwards by radiation per unit time. Okay, it's a per second thing because it's power here. But this wind's displacement law, I'm not very sure how, it, how to pronounce the name. Um, it tells you not in terms of the magnitude, but the frequency, or in this case, the wavelength, which is which the infrared waves are being produced. Okay, we know that when we classify infrared waves, okay, for any wave that is not probably not within a visible light spectrum, but let's say for the other spectrums, usually the waves there will be a how say a, there will be a spectrum as well. Okay, it's like infrared wave. There's a spectrum. There's a there's a whole series of wavelengths and frequencies. Okay, so it's not like one specific frequency of wavelength that we can say that this is infrared. Okay, there is a range of it. So now it tells you this this law tells you that for a certain temperature which for the range of infrared okay which one which wavelength will be the largest for which temperature so you can see that for this graph it shows you that at this particular temperature 5500 kelvins the largest wavelength in terms of intensity will be here and then after that you can see it tends towards the right okay as the temperature goes cooler and cooler so Hotter temperatures is probably like smaller wavelength. Lower temperature, higher wavelength. Okay, around there. So the higher temp, so you can see this. Uh, so the explanation is all here. Okay, but basically you only need to make use of this formula. Okay, with this constant given 2.898 times 10 power minus 3, it should be given to you during the Olympiad as well. Okay. Okay, so this is, so let's try this question. Okay, this question is from your MCQ. Okay, so 
so far only came out here. It doesn't really, it didn't really come out any other time. So this was like the only time it came out and it wasn't even a real paper. It was just a specimen paper. So in case it comes out, you can know. And in this case, they even give you the formula. You can see that this is the value for B. Okay, lambda, just that you don't know, you need to know what is lambda here. Okay, so it's like whether you know what this formula means. Okay, so what they are trying to say is that for black body here, for lambda T is with a constant. So from this point, and this point are two different cavities, two different temperatures. So you can use this to try and calculate, let's say for this first part, let's put this as A and then this as B. For A, it's going to be 2.9 times 10 power minus three, divided by two times 10 power minus six, to get a temperature of 1450 Kelvins. Okay, I hope you're following. Okay, so for B, same thing, we'll just use la, uh, T equals to this divided by lambda using four times 10 power minus six, you will get 725 Kelvins. Okay, so you, the formula is really given to you. So this is still a pretty straightforward question, just that you know what this lambda means only, okay? So I think what they mean here is the maximum, the M. So the difference in temperature Ta minus Tb will also give you 725 Kelvins. So that will give you an answer of C. Okay. Okay, Ken, good. We'll try uh, one or two more questions. Let me do a quick search. Okay, I found question eight. Okay, you can take a quick look. Okay, so question eight, basically, you can see it's an anti-clockwise cycle. Okay, so again, anti-clockwise cycle, the area inside here is going to be the work done on system. And the work done on is going to be positive. Now, delta W in this case is going to be positive. Okay, so first, we want to find the heat energy adsorbed. Why? Because in one full cycle, delta W equals to delta Q plus delta W. So now we, need, we know that this is positive. This must be a negative value because this is zero. One full cycle. Uh, let's see. Yep, work done on is larger than work done by. Correct. So because of that, we know that delta Q is equals to delta... Okay, let's find delta W first. Delta W will be the area on the graph pi d squared over four, okay? Uh, but this is, a, is, this may not be, it's not a full circle, although it looks like a circle, it may not be a circle, okay? So what happens is that you need to know that the ellipse, okay, if an uh, ellipse, by the way, is a, not a full circle, it's gonna be just like that, okay? Basically, there will be a minor axis and a major axis. Let's, let this be A, let this be B, lah, huh? So the area of the ellipse is given by pi AB. Just that when A and B are same, then it becomes a circle, you get pi R squared. Okay, so this is the area of an ellipse. So in this case, they didn't give the value, so it's not to scale. So although it looks like a circle, we cannot assume it to be a circle. Okay, so because of that, we use pi AB, the work done is going to be pi. Okay, in this case, this is going to be P2 minus P1 over four. Oh, over two, sorry, because we uh, divide by two, and then V2 minus V1 over two. And you can see that delta can, when you bring our delta Q over, or you, bring, or you bring delta W over, delta Q equals to negative delta W. So it will be a negative of this, and that's why answer should be A. A? Okay, so now let's try one last question. Okay, let me just find a nice question to go through. And most of the questions are pretty straightforward, okay? Because it's just normal temperature question. As long as you know this new stuff, add on with your uh, thermal properties of matter, your transfer of thermal energy, kinetic theory of matter, you should be able to understand most of the questions. Okay, I think there is, yep, question 29 is an interesting question. Okay. So you can see that 
the oxygen and nitrogen molecules in a room, they will have the same temperature. Let me just take a quick look to make, confirm the answer. 29 is going to be B. Okay. What happens is that they have the same temperature. I remember the, the, the key here is that temperature, this is from O levels, is a measure of average Ke. So in the same room, they have the same temperature, the average Ke must be the same. So it's only left A, B, and C. Okay. So this D and E is not, the E we're not sure yet, but the confirmed D is going to be out already. So what next will be understanding that Ke is half mv squared. The one with the higher mass will have a lower speed. So oxygen will be slower. So answer is B. A is pretty straightforward, you can see. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, you see, question 40. So here you have isothermal, isochloric, isothermal, isochloric. They make it easy. Which parts have heat flow to the gas? Okay. So uh, they did not say this should be a heat engine. Okay. A heat engine is used more. Okay. We say a heat engine is used to do work, right? It's used, usually it's used by a steam engines. Okay. It was a, it was a time where steam engines, it came out at a time where steam engines were the were the like the things that were powering trains uh, okay so in a way we when we see this scenario right we need to use a heat engine to power the submarine okay because you, it's not a fridge let's just put it that way most of the time you'll be using heat engine unless you want to like cool cool something down okay you use heat engine to do work to drive a train you can drive a ship as well okay steamship last time ships are also also powered by steam same so for this case uh uh, you should be a clockwise cycle because we need the network done by system to be positive. Okay, so for here, for this one, you can actually go recap on our. I'm just a bit lazy. I'll just go and show you what we have done earlier. You can recap on this page. And here, in this case, we are actually looking at isochloric and isothermal. Okay, so you can see that they want at which stage is heat supplied. So this is delta W, delta Q, delta U, and delta T. So heat supplies where it's the positive side and the positive side. Isochloric heating, okay, which means that it's going up, and isothermal expansion. Okay. So back to question. So isochloric heating, isothermal expansion, number one and number two. Answer should be C. Let's check. Question 40, yep, answer is C. Okay, so, okay. Uh. Last one, this again, his heat engine again. So you can see there's heat input, output, and this is the work done. So they give you the efficiency. In, in this case, they give you the formula. So instead of just giving you the Q in, they now give you the temperature. Okay. So you can see that although we say the efficiency in the earlier page, right? I gave you this. Okay. Or Q low over QH. Or Q2 over Q1. Okay. It can be simplified to using temperature as well because Q is going to be proportional to temperature. That's why they can do this. So you can simplify to using just temperature. Okay, this is what the, this is the heat source. This in this case is the environment. Okay, it's a heat engine. The heat source is like, for example, steam engine. You'll be boiling the water. It becomes steam. Pass the steam through the engine. Do work, and then the steam is released to the surroundings. That's how it works. Okay, so thermal conductivity, I think you'll see this again after the lesson on dimensional analysis. So the question is, what could be the maximum efficiency 
at a rate at an average rate of one kilojoules per second when the work is one kilojoules per second. Now, this formula here, right, is actually what we consider as not just efficiency, but the ideal efficiency because it's an ideal engine. So it's a maximum possible efficiency. Okay. Okay, so overall, the question looks very complicated. Okay, but actually, a lot of the data, I think, is not needed, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so what will happen is that, yeah, thermal conductivity is about how, if you recall from the dimensional analysis question, it's more of a, the time taken for the conduction, for the heat transfer to take place. Okay, so it's about how fast it can transmit. And it does not really have any... I can't see any implication on the efficiency. Okay. So I mean efficiency doesn't really need for need your need the time taken for it to transfer, I guess. So main thing, this will be the formula we can use. Again, everything must be in Kelvin's if you use the temperature. Now I see other stuff that they try to like trick you is that they give you 613 and 306, but you see that in the diagram they give you a different amount. Okay. So what will, what happens is that I think we need to follow. The how say the question the, the numbers that are in the question and not the diagram. Okay, I mean Olympic measures can be sometimes like that, so you just have to see how. Okay, so the maximum efficiency to me will be just one minus three zero six, which is the cold. Remember the at two seven three over six one three plus two seven three. From here, I get around thirty four point. 7%, which is closest to 30%. So I will take answer C. Okay. Okay, so I will end the lesson here. Okay, the I think I covered should be most of the hardest question I covered already. So you can look through the remaining questions. The answers are all here. These are all the suggested answers by the Olympiad themselves. Okay, may or may not be correct, but yeah, it, it's still the suggested answer. So you can take a quick look. The red, most of it should be able to do. So I hope, yep. You understand. So that will be the end of thermal physics lesson.